from a genetic standpoint, do you, uh, how do you feel about the God gene that um, because 90 some percent of the people in the world are, are religious or do believe in religion, how do you explain that? Um, from a well, I the human or genetic yes. point of view. I, I think I'd probably hesitate to talk about a God gene. Um, you, there does seem to be a universal tendency for all cultures, for all peoples, to invent gods. And, and it, it, they, they may differ in detail, but I think it's, I'm right to say anthropologists will tell you that all peoples have, have gods of some sort or another. It doesn't mean all individuals do, because individuals in any one society may escape from that. But it is a kind of universal feature of, of humanity, perhaps not quite as universal as sexual desire, but it's sort of like that. Um, so I think there is a genetic tendency to behave in some sort of a way which you might call religious. I prefer to say that it's a psychological predisposition which often manifests itself in the form of religion, but doesn't necessarily have to. And there could be a whole collection of psychological predispositions which together, collectively, uh, lead to religious belief. Things like obedience to authority. And you could easily imagine a genetic basis for obedience to authority which might actually have a Darwinian survival value. It might actually benefit, perhaps especially children, to believe what their parents tell them, what their authoritative elders of the tribe tell them. Because if they don't, they might um, do something dangerous, like, you know, walk into a fire or over a cliff or something. Um, so a genetic tendency to, um, to have a psychological predisposition to believe authority, there might be other ones as well. That's the kind of thing that could manifest itself as religious belief under the right conditions. After all, a child who's been told to do something sensible, like don't pick up snakes, um, the, the rule of thumb that, that's actually genetically coded for wouldn't be don't pick up snakes. It would be believe your parents. And, if you, and the rule of thumb that says believe your parents would have no way of distinguishing good advice like don't pick up snakes from, from silly advice or time-wasting advice like you know, kneel down and pray to the great god of the mountains five times a day or something. Well, do you think that religious belief has, has anything to do with survival? I think that the psychological predispositions that have led to religion, like obedience to authority, do have something to do with survival, yes. Whether religion itself has something to do with survival, I don't know. Uh, it might have, but that, of course, wouldn't make it true. Uh, it would just be an interesting fact. It seems to me that to say what I've just said, which is that I can't know that there's no God, but I think it's the same as, as fairies. That's a sort of cautious thing to say. I'm not saying there's definitely no God. But the arrogance of a religious person who just knows, not only knows that there's a God, but knows it's this God, it's the Christian God, it's the Trinity, and the Virgin Mary was born of a virgin. I mean, they've got it all written down pat, and they've got absolutely not a shred of evidence for any of it. That's arrogance. yourself an atheist? Yes. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, I think it means, I mean, it, it, it could be taken to mean somebody who's absolutely convinced that there is no God. And that would be going too far for me because I'm not absolutely convinced that there are no fairies. Um, but I put gods in the same category as fairies. Uh, there's an infinite number of things that you, that you could say, well, you can't disprove that. Uh, but you don't waste your time saying, oh, well, I'm agnostic about fairies, I'm agnostic about unicorns. Um, you say, until somebody comes along with a, with a good persuasive reason to believe in fairies or unicorns, then I'm not going to waste my time believing in them. And that's the, that's the sense in which I would call myself an atheist. I'm an, I'm a, I'm an agnostic in the same, about gods in the same way as I'm agnostic about fairies, which means that for all practical purposes, since I'm also an a-fairyist, I'm an, I'm an atheist. <laughs> Often atheists are accused of being arrogant and um, sort of overly aggressive. We're strident. You, 
you, you, you can't use the word atheist without, without preceding it with strident. We're always, we're all, we're always strident. I treasure Julia Sweeney's anecdote, uh, the actress who does a one-woman show called um, Letting Go of God, I think it is. And she's, de she's describing her gradual escape from the Roman Catholicism of her childhood. And she finally did escape. And, and she called herself an atheist. And this got into the papers. And her mother rang up in a sort of panic and said, well, I don't mind you not believing in God, but an atheist? <laughs> there is a certain amount of that uh, left over. But as for arrogance, if I could just come back on the, on the, on the arrogance, um, it seems to me that to say what I've just said, which is that I can't know that there's no God, but I think it's the same as, as fairies, that's a sort of cautious thing to say. I'm not saying there's definitely no God, but the arrogance of a religious person who just knows not only knows that there's a God, but knows it's this God, it's the Christian God, it's the Trinity, and the Virgin Mary was born of a virgin. I mean, they've got it all written down pat, and they've got absolutely not a shred of evidence for any of it. That's arrogance. It's the arrogance to say, yes, this is definitely, definitely a Trinity. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Virgin Mary was born of a virgin. Jesus rose on the third day. All that kind of thing, they're absolutely convinced of with no evidence at all. Now, that's arrogance. When you have a problem, when something, and I just assume since nobody gets a pass, that you've had crises in your life, yes. that you've had suffering in your life and pain, what gets you through when you don't have a God or a, a faith to turn well, to? Well, um, there's no, first of all, there's no obligation for anything to get you through. I mean, maybe, maybe nothing gets you through. And, and uh, I wouldn't put myself in that category, but even if I did, uh, that wouldn't be a good reason to believe in God. I had an Australian friend who's, who said, he, he was trying to explain why it is you see so many old people in church, and he said, cramming for the final. <laughs> <laughs> and what gets me through? I mean, friends, um, the good fellowship, the arm around the shoulders, the, um, the comfort of real human, companionship, the sympathetic look in the eye, the sympathetic smile, um, the squeeze of the hand, these are all immensely important. These are real, solid, warm human beings, not imaginary friends. Have you ever felt a, a transcendent moment in your life? Frequently, yes. Um, looking up at the Milky Way, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, um, looking down a microscope, looking through a telescope, um, just simply contemplating the Grand Canyon, the the, the depth of geological time that's displayed before you uh, in um, when you look at masses of geological strata, uh, looking at fossils, um, transcendent in the sense of the, the sort of upwelling of emotion that, that, that you get when you contemplate vastness of space, vastness of time, vastness of complexity in living things. Um, yes, transcendent, yes, supernatural, no.